Where do Jews live? Or even better, where don't they live? Jews have really made their homes all over the world, sometimes in the most unexpected of places. Would you believe that there were once thriving Jewish communities in Libya and Afghanistan and Guyana? And even more wild, there are still thriving Jewish communities in places as far flung as the Peruvian rainforest and the Siberian tundra. So how did Jews end up in these surprising locations? Let's explore five communities that still exist today. Number one, Iquitos, Peru. If a tree falls in the middle of the rainforest with no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? If no one around you recognizes you as Jewish, would you continue to practice your faith? That's a question the Jews of Iquitos, Peru have faced firsthand. Reachable only by plane or boat, Iquitos is the definition of isolated. Its Jewish community? Even more so. With no more than 70 people and a synagogue housed in a mattress shop, Iquitos isn't the first place I would have chosen to create a Jewish community. But in the 1880s, the Amazon rubber boom drew Jewish Moroccan businessmen who set up shop in the isolated city, as well as Ashkenazi Jews fleeing European anti-Semitism. But the rubber boom didn't last, and many Jews returned to their home countries or moved to the Peruvian capital. The Jews who remained in Iquitos were primarily men married to local Amazonian women. Though they tried to pass on their traditions, their numbers sank. That is, until the 1980s. That's when some of Iquitos' few remaining Jews reached out to Rabbi Guillermo Bronstein, who transformed the community. He donated prayer books. He convened three Jewish courts to conduct conversions. He even sent a mohel to perform circumcisions. Today, most of Iquitos' young Jews have moved to Israel, and the community is dwindling. But those who remain are tight-knit and continue to practice proudly. Number two, Namibia. In Swakopmund, Namibia, a small cemetery boasts an unusual grave. Here lies Walter Goller, kosher le Pesach, with the Hebrew words scrawled upside down. Was the engraving a mistake? A joke? We may never know. But we do know that Namibia has been home to a Jewish community since the mid-1800s, when two brothers from Cape Town established a trading post there. When Namibia became a German colony shortly after, European pioneers streamed in. Among them were Jews who established the diamond and mining industries, built new railway lines, and implemented new methods of irrigation. These colonists were joined in the 1900s by Ashkenazi Jews fleeing anti-Semitism. And by 1927, Namibia was home to two synagogues. At its height in the 1950s, about 120 Jewish families lived in the Windhoek community. Today, the community estimates that around 45 Jews remain, with another dozen or so in Kit Manswop. Periodically, a traveling rabbi makes his way to Namibia. What does my job entail? It entails basically getting into the car, that's why I'm called a traveling rabbi, or into an airplane, and I travel from small town to small town to small town. The rest of the time, the community's lay leaders take charge of running a thriving community. They're the ones who lead prayer services and make sure the community's kids get a Jewish education. Every Friday night, a handful of dedicated congregates show up for Shabbat services. And I mean dedicated. The community's oldest member, Harold Pupkowitz, came to nearly every service until his death in 2012. He described his love for his adopted country. Being born in Vilnius and knowing what discrimination meant and coming here to Namibia and experiencing freedom for the first time created a love for this country which nothing will ever eradicate. The Windhoek community even published its own book in 2014, giving readers around the world a glimpse into this relatively unknown but highly dedicated community. Number three, Gibraltar. Jews might have a rocky history with Spain, but Jewish life in Gibraltar has remained rock solid for centuries. Oh, we're not going anywhere, Jet. No, literally. A community of around 850 Jews lives around a giant limestone formation that gave Gibraltar its nickname of the Rock. Records show that Jews have been living in Gibraltar since the 1300s. But when Spain expelled its Jews, the community was forced to flee. As long as Gibraltar was in Spanish hands, Jews were not welcome. In fact, when Spain gave up Gibraltar to England, the Spanish monarchy demanded that the Brits continue to keep all Jews out. Nice guys, real nice. But the Brits were desperate for trading partners, and Moroccan Jewish merchants were just across the strait. So the Brits and the Moroccans made a deal, allowing Moroccan Jews to settle in Gibraltar temporarily to trade. In the mid-1700s, the British granted the Jews the right to settle permanently, and the Jews of Gibraltar began re-establishing their community in full force. 
Within 60 years, half of Gibraltar's population was Jewish. The community had everything, four synagogues, a Ladino newspaper, a thriving culture, and most importantly, a nearly unheard of harmony between neighbors. No matter their religion, all of Gibraltar's residents lived together in peace. It was like life in Spain all over again. You know, without the Inquisition. During World War II, the British evacuated all of Gibraltar's residents, Jewish and otherwise. The Navy has brought many women and children from Gibraltar. And in Britain, the kindness and generosity of the American Red Cross is providing clothes and toys for them. Many never returned. But in recent years, the community has experienced a revival. Thanks to a high birth rate and immigration from Great Britain, Gibraltar's ancient Jewish community is thriving once again. Number four, Japan. No one knows exactly when the first Jews came to Japan, though historians speculate around the 1500s. They'd be the only Jews in the country for the next 250 years after Japan closed its doors to the outside world. But once the doors were reopened, Jews from Poland, the US, and England set up shop just south of Tokyo. Soon, the community boasted a synagogue, school, cemetery, and burial society. One of the earliest Jewish immigrants, an American businessman even began the first foreign language newspaper in the country, the Japan Express. By the late 1860s, Yokohama was home to roughly 50 Jewish families. They were soon joined by Russian Jews fleeing the pogroms. These Russian Jewish refugees settled in Nagasaki, which soon grew to twice the size of Japan's original Jewish community. But violence soon followed. The Russo-Japanese War sent many of Nagasaki's Russian Jewish members fleeing once again, with thousands of others taken prisoner. While Japan did buddy up with the Nazis in World War II, Japan's leaders had no particular hostility towards their Jewish residents. One heroic Japanese consul even saved 6,000 Jews from the Holocaust by issuing them with transit visas. Today, Japan's Jewish community is estimated to be around 2,000 Jews. More than half are from the US, a quarter from Israel, some are Japanese converts, and the rest come from all over the world. In a country notorious for being homogenous, the Jewish community is a unique mix of customs and cultures. In Kobe, Jews keep Sephardic traditions alive, while Tokyo synagogues cater to both Orthodox and egalitarian worshippers. There may not be a lot of Jews in Japan, but their communities are tight-knit. Number five, Siberia. When most people think of the Jewish state, they usually think of Israel, land of milk and honey, promised in the Bible, etc., etc. They usually don't think about a frigid, swampy province on the Russian-Chinese border. But 20 years before the state of Israel, an unlikely leader was doing his very best to carve out a Jewish state in Birobidjan, Siberia. That leader? None other than Joseph Stalin. Yeah, that Joseph Stalin. We don't usually think of Stalin as a Zionist hero. That's because he really, really wasn't. In fact, Birobidjan was Stalin's socialist alternative to Zionism. After all, why should the Jews resettle in Palestine when the Soviet Union could use them to fortify their border. Stalin dreamed of transforming Russia's Jews into productive agricultural workers. Yeah, he basically wanted to create a kibbutz in Siberia. Not original Stalin. But here's the surprising thing. Lots of Soviet Jews supported Stalin's plan. They'd have their own little corner of the Soviet utopia. And maybe then, they'd finally be considered Soviet enough to be accepted. And that's the story of the first Jewish state in a few thousand years. It became known as the Jewish Autonomous Region, a title it still holds today. It's not difficult to tell that we're in the capital of the Jewish Autonomous Region. The slogan, to the Jewish homeland, rang throughout Jewish Soviet neighborhoods. Many Jews had already been barred from their professions as craftspeople after the Bolshevik Revolution. They had nothing more to lose. So thousands accepted the state's one-way tickets to Birobidjan. But there's a reason no one knows that Birobidjan exists. Well. Two reasons. The first is that the region was completely unprepared for an influx of settlers. It had few roads and buildings with just a tight barracks to live in. Most of the land was totally unworkable. All the desirable land had already been taken by Russians, Cossacks, Koreans, and Ukrainians who did not appreciate this influx of Jews. So nearly half of the early Jewish settlers left, but the other half persevered. And by the mid 1930s, Birobidjan was a hub of Soviet Jewish culture with the Sholem Aleichem Theater, Yiddish schools, and a local newspaper. So what's the second reason no one's ever heard of this bastion of Jewish culture? You guessed it, good old-fashioned anti-Semitism. Stalin wasn't what we call a stable dude. 
Like all autocrats, he was fiercely protective of his power. It wasn't long before he turned his attention, yet again, to the age-old scapegoats, the Jews. Secret police stormed into the town, throwing the region's esteemed poets and writers in jail for promoting Yiddish culture. So, just as in the rest of the Soviet Union, Jewish culture in the so-called Jewish state was forced underground. But here's the wild thing. There are still Jews in Birobidjan today, as many as 3,000 of them, in fact. And the so-called Jewish autonomous region still bears marks of its Jewish past, like statues of the Yiddish writer Shalom Aleichem. Yiddish sing-alongs from the local Jewish community group still ring through the streets. And though the town newspaper is now published in Russian, it still prints two pages in Yiddish every week. Wild. Around the world, despite booms and busts, challenges and triumphs, Jewish communities have continued to cling to their cultures and traditions. No matter where we live in the world, we do our best to keep the ancient flame alight.